2 Timothy, just to kind of catch you back up. 2 Timothy, chapter number 3, the prophetic events of the final days. I hope you'll stay around for the morning service. I hope we have something uh, for you that'll be a help to you. I hope this is too, but um, these last days, and I just I had the, the privilege of being in uh, Kentucky slash Ohio for a meeting there, and um, you would be surprised, not what that preacher was saying, but what people are trying to do with the Bible to try to make it fit uh, for what's going on in the United States without thinking about considering, pausing about the rest of the entire world and what's going on there. They're literally taking Matthew 24 and superimposing it on uh, what's going on in the United States of America. And you'd be absolutely astonished at what they can read into the passages that are not even in the passages. And that's without even having, that's just listening without even having your Bible opening and going, where in the world are they getting that kind of information from? But they're so bound and determined, and this is my point for bringing it up, they're so bound and determined that they're going to make it fit, that they twist it to make it fit. They, what the Bible calls, rest the Scriptures to their own destruction. There's nothing worse than trying to show that you have authority by misplacing Scripture and making it fit what you want it to say. I mean, they're reading everything in it you could possibly imagine. And I have yet to hear, not that we're the only ones that do it, but I have yet to hear anybody give you real end-time prophecy for the church. End-time prophecy for the church is found right here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it is the epitaph on the final church. Now, I'm going to make this clear. Just because it's what Paul writes about what will happen before the rapture occurs doesn't mean you have to be a part of what's listed here. It is indicators, or maybe you might call it a, a, a self-imposed or a self-examination uh, quiz, that if you begin to see these things showing up in your life, it's indicative of the fact that your fellowship with Jesus Christ may not be where it needs to be. Most important thing in your life after your salvation is your fellowship with Jesus Christ. I think probably the most valuable thing that He gave you after salvation and eternal security is the book you have in your lap and making good use of it. I look at the book of Job and I think to myself, Job went through some pretty hard times and some pretty difficult things and Job had nothing to read. Job had to go through the thing and just have occasional communication with God and things like that. The majority of Job's life wasn't an everyday, the Lord come in, sit down with him, pull up a chair, pull up a stool and then spend time talking to him. And you got a book you can read every day. And so you look at that and then you look at the Apostle Paul. Yeah, but by the time the Apostle Paul came up with, he almost had a completed canon of Scripture besides the 13 books that he wrote. So having a Bible to be able to read, I think, will cause us to be uh, held into an account when we get there to the Lord. As a matter of fact, before I read this to you, come to 2 Corinthians 5. And let me just make this point to you. Uh, a lot of people are trying nowadays to get you, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, to get your mind on uh, something other than what's important for you. Knowing when the rapture is going to occur is not as important as what happens after it occurs. Knowing when it occurs is not as important as knowing what happens after it occurs. After the rapture occurs, the tribulation and things that are really bad down here on this earth takes place. That's called a pre-tribulation rapture. That's what we are. That's what we believe. We believe Jesus Christ is going to come and get us before the tribulation. Doesn't mean you won't have trouble. What you need to recognize is, is that truth misplaced is the most dangerous truth. Every cult finds itself in a situation where it takes a truth and misplaces as far as timing is concerned. In Matthew chapter number 4, one of the definitive passages that you find in the wilderness of temptation for the Lord, every one of those last three temptations are the right things and they're scripturally sound, but they're at the wrong time. All the devil wants to do is to try to get you to do the right thing, but to do it at the wrong time. And if you do it at the wrong time, it's misplaced. It doesn't do you any good. Preacher, do you believe baptism saves you? No, I do not. But I do believe it did. And I do believe it will again. 
You treat, preach salvation by grace through faith in the tribulation period, those people will die and go to hell. You say, why? They have to keep the commandments, have faith in Jesus Christ, and they have to keep the law, don't take the mark of the beast, all those things. There's works connected with that. He said, well, I don't want to believe that. Stay around for it and watch it yourself then if that's what you want to do. What happened prior to Jesus Christ coming? The gospel of the kingdom was preached. And what was that? The Messiah's coming. That's what will be preached in the, in the tribulation period. The Messiah's coming is not part of your gospel. You know what your gospel is? How that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, was buried and raised again the third day according to Scripture. That's your gospel. Somebody else that preached to you, repent and be baptized everyone in the name of Jesus Christ and preach Matthew chapter 18 and preach uh, Acts chapter number 2 and preach all that other kind of stuff. They're lying to you and they're sending you to hell with Scripture. Right. With Scripture. Yep. You go to certain churches, certain, uh, uh, for instance, let's just use Roman Catholics, not the people, the, the teaching. Roman Catholics believe, first of all, you've got to have a godfather and a godmother and you have to be Christian when you're real young and that kind of a thing because you're being accepted in or why, otherwise you go to limbo if you die if you're a baby. And then as you begin to come up and stuff like that, you have to take the sacraments. That's the Lord's Supper, and you have to have that infant baptism connected with you. You don't ever read of any older people being baptized in the Catholic Church. It's infants. Well, when you get baptized, ladies and gentlemen, it's supposed to be a willing decision. When you got saved, you had to know you were a sinner. You weren't just automatically saved. You had to know you were a sinner. Amen. How can you get saved if you don't know what you're getting saved from? You don't just wake up one day and go, well, I've just always been. No, 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 no. You recognized I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell if I don't change and I can't change myself. So I got to have somebody take my place. Who would that be? That'd be Jesus Christ. Whether you get dunked or don't get dunked doesn't make any difference at all. Doesn't affect whether we have the Lord's Supper or don't. Of course, I have been thinking of some unusual ways maybe to do that. Maybe be able to have you line up here and I get me a squirt gun full of grapefruit ju or grape juice and maybe have one of the guys here stand there and just let them, you know, kind of throw it at you, of course, with gloves on. I don't know how to do that. But I, I, oh, that's funny, man. It's not. Look, look, we do that thing. You know why you take the Lord's Supper? You take the Lord's Supper for two reasons. The first reason is so you judge yourself. And the second is, is to remember Jesus Christ is coming one day and you need to make sure that your sins are confessed and that you're ready to face Him. Where? At the judgment seat. Now make sure you understand this. When you go to the judgment seat of Christ, your sins that have been forgiven you, past, present, and future, are forgiven. That's judicially. But if you have unconfessed sin, you can't claim to be in fellowship with the Lord until you square accounts with Him up there. Amen. One of the things may be here in this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, one of these things might be the terror of the Lord is, is the Lord call you into account and say, why didn't you confess that sin? Amen. I made a way for you to stay in fellowship with me. I want to ask you a question. Why aren't you in fellowship with me? Amen. Now you're raptured. Now you can't change it. You say, well, Lord, I'm here and I'm in heaven. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Lord said, yeah, but we got some business. Before we start meeting out gold, silver, and precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble, we got some business. How come you're not in fellowship with me right now? It doesn't line up in the Bible where all of a sudden we're all up there in heaven and the Lord just writes off the slate everything that anybody did in the Christian life. There's a terror that takes place up there and part of that terror that takes place is the Lord calling you into account for things He already called you into account for here and you didn't do anything with it. Now, I know that's hard. I know that seems rough. But you can't have somebody get saved and then go on and live a life of luxury and live a life of pleasing the flesh and doing whatever they want to do and have no remorse for anything whatsoever. And they go to heaven while their sins are paid for and then they get rewarded like you people. It don't work like that. They're going to get up there and the Lord's going to say, give an account. What did you do? Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Well, preacher, I, you know, I want you to know I've done this and this and this and this and this. Okay, good. That's great. That's wonderful. I see that maybe as great physical success. How's God see it? Amen. What's God think about it? You're going to come to a day where what God thinks is really going to matter to you. It may not matter to you right now at all, even though you're in church. You may not even be thinking about what does God think about it. You're going to come to a day where the only one that matters what they think is what God thinks. What people think about you is not going to make a difference at all. You're not going to have a bunch of jury of your peers up there and they're all going to say, but he was so nice and he did this and he did that and he did so on and so forth. You're not going to find that there. You're going to find the, the chief cook and bottle washer going to make the judgment. 
and it's going to be, you give an account to Him. Look at this passage in 2 Corinthians, and I'll, I'll get on with this. This is imperative. It's important you say, why? If anything that this stuff should do to you right now is, if the possibility were to exist that you may no longer exist on this earth, you've got to consider eternity. You've got to consider if I'm not going to be here till 70, 80, 90 years of age, if I'm not going to be, if the Lord punches my ticket today, how will I be in the judgment? You've got to consider that. You say, well, preacher, no, that's great liberty. That way I know every night when I get ready to go to bed, I pray and I say, Lord, forgive me. Now, I know you folks are real good people and you don't have the problems I do, but especially if I've been on the road or I've been traveling or something like that, I have a lot to confess you say, why? Because I look at people and I make judgments. And I think things and I should care about their soul and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, somebody should do the world a favor and stop you from breathing my air. The, 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 the stuff they say, the filth that spews out of their mouth, it just, it, see, it bothers me. I, I feel like Jeremiah sometimes. You come up out of the pit and you see something and start to say, and the Lord says, uh-uh, you can't speak my name anymore. And why is that bothering you? Lord, I mean, do you see what? And are you? And the Lord's like, I see it. So, so sometimes I have to say, and Lord, forgive me, and I should have witnessed to him. <laughs> I feel like walking up to him and saying, well, go on and go to hell then. You know, we're going down the jetway thing the other day, getting ready to get on in uh, Atlanta, I guess it was, or Cincinnati, Atlanta. And we're coming down through there. And there's a woman, a woman of all, for all, a woman. I mean, man, I'm telling you what, and if you were in the military and you were a sailor, I don't mean this in a derogatory manner, but I mean, every word out of her mouth was just like pure sewage. I mean, just... And I'm, and I'm going down and I'm waiting and you have to wait and you have to give them and then they, and then you, you know, they're helping you keep your distance kind of thing, you know, and you got all the, you got on everything but a hazmat suit and all that, you know, and all this kind of a deal and, you know, and you're, and after a while I learned pretty good. I'm easily trained. I mean, like I can, you can point to somebody else, but it's the price you pay to travel. I get it. I understand. No problem. And so we're coming down through there. And this woman, man, behind me is, I mean, she, she's cussing everything there is to cuss. I mean, the carpet and the jetway and the people on there. Look at them stupid spots over there. And they're trying to tell people, say, do you think anybody's even reading that at all? And I felt like turn around and say, would you shut your cotton-picking mouth? You're making everybody nervous as a stinking cat. You're, I mean, why you got to be talking about this and blank this and blank that and blank this and I'll be blanked if I'm going to do this and all that. I got on the plane. I remember what the old preacher used to say. I pray and take the D-blanks off the plane. I got on I said, Lord, there's a lot of D-blanks on this plane. Would you take them off so I can get home safe, please? I have a lot to confess. I wasn't thinking about her being in heaven. For all I know, she might be a Christian talking like that. Have no idea. I'd probably turn around and hand her a track and she'd be like, why are you handing me that? I'm saved. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. And so I, I got on that thing and I thought to myself, you know, something is amazing to me. I guess all that people think about is their own self and their own comfort and what's going to go on. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? How about you, boy? Did you get up and thank the Lord this morning you could breathe? That you weren't in a wheelchair? Did you thank the Lord that you're over here? How come you're any different than her after your background? It seemed like you wouldn't be preaching. You feel all hyper clean, do you? You Pharisee, you? So then the Lord said you might want to take some of those D blanks off yourself. Because you're, you know, that bothers you so bad? Okay, good. How about how you're living with me? And then he flipped the whole thing around on me. I don't like when he does that. But you know what I know? I know the more I study this thing that I'm going to show you here in just a second, there's something to that terror of the Lord and it's more than a beating. It's God pulling out things where the Holy Ghost has convicted you. That's the third part of the Trinity, not a lesser part, but that's God Himself in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit where He's come to you and you said, leave me alone. And you said, I don't want to talk to you. And He said, confess it. And you said, I ain't doing it. I'm going to do what I want to do. And the Lord brings you up there and said, I don't appreciate how you treated the Holy Spirit. Appreciate how you treated me. How'd you like to have that pulled out in public face to face? 
I don't know about you. I get ready to pray at night. I have enough problems sometimes fall asleep confessing the things I did during the day, things I thought, things between my ears. That's where your problem is. That's where we're going this morning. What's between your ears? You know how to hold the other stuff. I thought to myself, yeah, I don't have to pray that. And Lord, forgive me of the sins that I even, don't even know I committed, that I committed, and I'm sorry I committed those. <laughs> All I have to do is just confess the ones I know. Those are the ones that plague me. Coolidge is the one that made that statement one time. What do you think about what the Bible says? Or do you understand the Bible? He said, it's not the things I don't understand that bother me. It's the things I do. Amen. <laughs> That's the stuff that give me a fit. That's what keeps me awake at night. The, the, the uh, horses under the myrtle trees and Zephaniah or Zechariah, they don't, they don't bother me at all. They really don't. Anna finding the, the asses at the end of that long uh, dissertation there of the generations of so-and-so and listing all those people. And then Anna finding the donkeys there in the, in the woods and all that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't, that don't keep me awake at night. It's that other stuff that lands on my doorstep. Like love your enemies and do good to those that despitefully use you. <laughs> See, you folks, don't y'all don't have a problem with that. Y'all are like, oh, I'm, I'm good. Waitress treats you bad and you don't have any problems leaving her extra money or her tip, do you? <laughs> you pay her what she's worth, don't you? Never thought for a moment that maybe God's saying to you, uh, maybe she's having a bad day and a rough day and why don't you prove her that she's wrong about you and that she can talk to you that way and bring your food to you cold and not get the order right and so on and so forth and you leave her a 20. And you walk out of there and she's thinking, oh, what in the world was that? Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I'm coming to Timothy in just a second if I ever get around to it. This Apostle Paul talking here, it's a great passage. In verse number 5, he said, We're confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body. I am to be present with the Lord. I am. I'd soon get out. I'm not taking up a trip today. But if the Lord were to call me out today, I'd be perfectly fine. We therefore labor, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. It's not your salvation. He's talking about accepted. Why? Because I'm doing what God wants me to do. Let me say this about what God wants you to do. He may want you to be riding a pew right now. He may want you to take care of your family. He might want you to take care and be a good employee. That's not just for people that are preachers and missionaries. It's what does God want you to do. And it changes over a period of time. Right now, especially if you're young and you're raising young kids and stuff like that, you want to make sure that you raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but don't wind up being so uh, involved in the ministry. You make your family bitter because you never have any time for them. Amen. On the flip side of that, you want to make sure that you're not spending so much time with your family, you make the Lord upset with you because right. you don't have any balance. Right. Balance is an important thing. All right, and notice what he says. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, the all right there can't be everybody in the world. Who's he addressing? Saved people. We've talked about it before. Three people addressed in your Bible, Jew, Gentile, and church. So the church is who he's talking to. All right, God talking that everyone, every one of those that have to appear, all saved people, may receive the things done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That's a rough one. We usually hang and stop on the good. But he said you're going to receive for the bad. Well, what would the bad be? It would be the things you did that God didn't want you to do. There's a price to pay. That's why it's important to keep short accounts with the Lord. When you sin, confess. You say, well, I'm going to do it again. Confess it again. Well, I might do it again. Confess it again. I, you say, why? The Lord provided a way for you to get that thing covered by the blood, and you want to thank God for that and take advantage of it. It's not a matter of always having victory. It's the fact that God likes that you work on it. Listen, no results with all, all the efforts you have. God likes that. So preacher, I didn't amount to this and nothing happened there and this and that, but I put everything I had into it. God said, I like that. It doesn't matter that the end result is, is you wound up being successful. It's the fact that you're trying. 
God's impressed with you trying. You're nothing but a human, frail, feeble, like grass chopped off by a lawnmower. They're nothing anyway. What God looks at, He's like down there. I remember the illustration of my dad. I'm sorry if I bore you with these illustrations, but I remember my dad. I was uh, playing ball one time, and I wasn't a great ball player. My brother was a great ball player, but I, I, could, I was a good blocking dummy. But at any rate, I'm, uh, at, on that time, I'm playing the, the outside corner there, a defensive end, and a guy came through, and I mean, he stinking plowed my taters, man. I mean, they ran over me like a stinking herd of buffalo, man, and all I had was stinking cleats up my, on, my, uh, on my front side because my back side was laying. My back end of my uniform was just muddy and dirty. <laughs> and I lined up. You know what happens? I guess if it works for you one time, it'll work for you another time. They ran three plays right at me. I mean, three plays. I could never turn them on the inside. They'd always come in. They didn't worry about, I'm supposed to box them and make them go to the inside where the linebacker can get them. They didn't worry about that. They just ran over me. It wasn't a matter of whether we're going outside or in. They could have their choice. I didn't exist. Those two pulling guards would come out there and here they'd come. And I'd stand there and hit them knowing I was going to get knocked on my, my, uh, my, my backside, man. And I'd stand there and hit them. It was futile. At the end of that thing, my dad said, boy, I sure was proud of you. I said, what do you mean you were proud of me? He said, well, you kept getting back up. <laughs> He said, you kept getting back up, son. You kept getting back up. I didn't realize it till later on that he said, you know what? At least you kept trying. At least you kept trying. You got knocked down, you get up. You got knocked down, you get up. You know what my heavenly father says? You got knocked down and you got back up. It's not the fact that you got knocked down. It's the fact that you got back up. And you just keep getting back up. And you just keep getting back up. If you'd learn that, you would stop being so disgruntled and discouraged in the Christian life. All right, I got knocked down. Get up. Well, I got knocked down again. I, I messed up again. I fouled up again. Oh, what a mess I made again. I can't believe it. Get back up. Get back up. Get back up. Get back up. Well, I went back to my besetting sin. I went back to my trouble. I went back to this. I'm in the throes of depression again. Get back up. Get back up. Get back up. There's a woman over there called a woman with an issue of blood. You know what I know about her? You wouldn't be reading about her if she didn't get up one last time. You know what I know about her? She got up and went to Jesus. You know what I admire about her? She got up. She got up. She took her issues to Jesus. What are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you the Lord provides you a way. He's not expecting perfection. Stop living under that. Stop thinking that you could ever be perfect anyway. Cut yourself a little bit of slack. I messed up. Did you mess up? I did. I messed up. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to lay here and waller in it. That's what pigs do. Sheep don't like laying around in there. I'm, I'm getting my wool messed up. I'm getting my dew messed up. I, I, I'm, I'm getting back up. I'm flat on my back. I'm wall I ain't wallering in it. I'm getting back up. Sheep go to squalling. Pigs go to sleep. Sheep go to squall. They don't like the mud. You ever watch a sheep get in the mud? You say, why? It weighs their wool down. They get scared. Something's going to happen to them. It gets them dirty. They don't like wallowing around in that. So what do they do? They get up and they get out of that kind of stuff. They get up and get out. Say, so what do pigs do? Just lay there and waller in it. Just lay there and just, just waller. They like that mud on them. They think it's the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> you ever heard this statement? Happy as a pig in mud. Well, I guess some of you won't, won't pick up the inference there, but you know what happens to the prodigal? Where do you find him? Do you find him tending sheep or do you find him in a hog pen? Guess he must have got comfortable watering in it. Do you know what you got to do? Get up and get out of the hog pen, man. You say, how do you do that? Plead the blood. Take a shower. Take a shower. Take a shower. Take a shower. Get enough bleach, enough Clorox in that thing. The next time you start sweating in your uniform, you smell like a bleach commercial. You say, what are you doing? Washing out the stains, washing out the stains, washing out the stains. Oh, you messed up? Yep. Yeah, I did. I'll learn how to do better next time or I'll get bigger and I'll get stronger. Or next time they'll wish they hadn't come to my corner three times in a row. <laughs> That was after one set of downs. They did that almost the whole day. I always wondered, maybe the coach didn't like me or something because he just left me in there. How come I remember that? I remember that because I guess the coach said, well, at least if I put him there, he won't just throw in the towel. At least he's slowing him down. <laughs> they got to slow down long enough to knock him down. He ain't going to back up. You know, that's all the Lord's expecting from you. That's all he's expecting from you. You want to go to the judgment seat of Christ and have a short account? Lord, I fell down. What'd you do? Got back up. Got back up. Got back up. Confessed it. Confessed it. Confessed it. Confessed it. Confessed it. 
confessed it, confessed it. Okay, good. Praise the Lord. You apply the blood? I did. Get on up here. Yes. Let's talk about what you did right. <laughs> that's one thing you did right. And that's one thing that everybody in here should have in common. Amen. You know that thing will help you so much? And you say, how will it help me? It'll help you if you remember how many times you got knocked on your can. It'll help you when you look at somebody that got knocked on their can. And instead of stomping them down into the mud and laughing at them and mocking them and making fun of them and belittling them and thinking of that, you know what you say? I've been down that mud, man. Come on, let me help you up. I've been down that mud. Come on down here. Let me help you up. Good. Next thing you know, that old outside linebacker will start making his way over to the corner and he'll help you and have to hit two of you instead of one of you. Yeah. Yeah. You say, why? After a while, they start figuring out what's going on. You're picking on my friend over here. Next thing you know, standing shoulder to shoulder with you. Well, when we go down, we'll go down together. <laughs> but they'll have to slow down. Good. If you could get a hold of that, you'd quit being so hard on other people. Amen. The only reason you're hard on other people is, is because of how you perceive yourself. Yep. God always makes a Blu-ray or a DVD or an MP3 or whatever all that electronic stuff is. You know what he does? You ever wonder why you can't forget your sin? He forgets it. How come you don't forget it? Do you ever wonder about that? Come on, and nobody in here has any problem remembering your failure, do you? You know why God does, God does that? To remind you so you'll be compassionate with other people and to remind you of the hurt and the damage it did so you'll be slower to react the next time. That's why. Remember when you did that before? Look at the mess you made. Look at what happened. Look at how bad it was. You see that? You sure you want to do that again? Somebody comes to you and says, man, I've done so on and so forth. The Lord... Roll them. And you say, well, I don't have to give you the details of my life, but I know what it's like to mess up, fess up, and get up. So come on here, let me help you back up. Amen. That's important. So Notice what he says here in this passage. I ain't going to have time to get over to Timothy if I keep messing around here. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether according to it done, whether it be good or bad. A fellow said to me one time, he said, well, why do you keep bringing up the, the, the bad stuff? I said, why would you be worried about it? unless you're planning on showing up with a bunch of it. Why would you worry about it? That's what he said. You're going to give good or bad. Well, now what I really think that means, you know exactly what it means. You know the difference in good and bad. You know the difference in right and wrong, don't you? Don't you? Your Father in Heaven is not going to hold you accountable for something you don't know about. I told you a couple of weeks ago, every whooping I got, my dad made sure that I understood why I was getting a whooping. He didn't just leave it to my own imagination as to why I thought, you know why you're getting a whipping, he'd say. He'd point that big finger at me. He'd say, you know why you're getting a whipping, boy? He called me boy. Boy, you know what I'm, I'm 16, 17. Boy, he'd say, boy. He called me boy till he died. But anyway, he said, boy. He said, you know why you're getting a whipping? I said, yes, sir. He'd say, why? That's, that's the terrible thing. Now you've got to tell him. You know, it's like he wants to make sure you understand. Okay, I wanted to make sure. Sometimes you kind of plead your case a little bit. But I've learned my lesson and I really understand and all that kind of stuff. Okay, good. We're going to just put a stamp of approval on that <laughs> and give me a whooping. However your parents did it, that's your business. And my dad must have done it to me because I was hard-headed or whatever. I have no idea. Maybe like that mule out in the field had to be hit in the head with a 4 by 4 to get his attention. Here's what I want you to understand. He puts bad in there for a reason. And what you need to be worried about more than you're worried about whether the virus is going to jump on you and who's going to win an election and whether or not China's going to go to war in Taiwan and whether this and whether that and so on and so forth. You know what you ought to be worried about, wringing your hands about and worry. You ought to be in a sweat over when you give an account of yourself to God for the things done in your body that he gave you, whether it be good or bad. And if you'd get jacked up about that instead of whether or not you should go stand on the Capitol stairs and, and protest against whether or not you should or shouldn't have the right to meet. What a thing, man. Yes. You're going to get up there and Lord, Lord, I'm telling you, man, I, I took a Bible with me and I stood out in Tallahassee. I was at the Capitol building right when the governor came by. Oh, I stood before Pilate face to face. What is your point? They crucified me and they made you wear a mask. Yeah. Are you weigh it out? It's your, your business. <laughs> oh, you have a little faith. You should protect yourself. I'm not talking about running around naked in a leper colony. 
exposing yourself to people that have got diseases and stuff. Don't be stupid. Don't be crazy. But don't turn it into something that's not. That's a decision to protect your flesh. It's not spiritual at all. And don't make it spiritual. It is a decision for you to decide to protect your physical well-being. It has nothing to do with God whatsoever. I got two. Amen. The rest of you are like. And for those of you that were born in 2020, when the terrible pandemic struck, step forward to the judgment seat. And we're going to see which side you came in on. See how still it is? Don't make that spiritual. It ain't spiritual at all. It's like when they tell me to put on my seatbelt. You say, why do they do that? Well, because flesh and metal and glass don't mix too well. Do you even know why they originally came up with seat belts? I'm going to sound sarcastic when I say this. I doubt you do. Do you know who instituted seat belts? Do you know where it first got traction? You say it was the government. No, it wasn't. It was insurance companies because your speed limit was 70 and 80 miles an hour and when people were having crashes, the amount of property damage and physical damage that was done to individuals and hospital bills and people dying and that kind of stuff was costing the insurance companies a lot of money. And so they said, you know what we need to do? We need to do something to strap these people in so that we have less death and injury. Your cars in the old days were made like Sherman tanks. And when they hit something that didn't dent the car, but it was killing people. And I'm serious. You could run into you like driving a stinking battleship down the street. And so what happened is, is they started making your cars to crack like tin. They learned that from the race car drivers. The race car drivers tried to make their cars lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter so that it would absorb the impact instead of repel the impact. And then they started recognizing some things. And so the insurance company began to get some people together and some lobbyists. And they started saying, if we can get people to two things, lower the speed limit from 70 to 55. You said that was a gas crisis. No, it wasn't. It wasn't energy at all. It was if we lower the speed by 15 miles an hour, we can reduce the amount of death and injury. Therefore, we can save the insurance companies a lot of money. Go do the history research or take my word for it, whatever you want to do. That wasn't done by your state government trying to protect you. That was initiated. Why? The love of money is the root of all evil. And what they started to recognize, we have more cars out there and the faster they go, the more of them that die or get severely hurt. They got gigantic hospital bills. So click it or tick it. That's the truth. I Well, I'm not wearing it. Okay, fly through the windshield with the greatest of ease, man. I don't care. <laughs> that's what you want to do, lock it behind you, you know, just in case you happen to roll over and you find yourself in a, a pond somewhere and you can't escape because you're going to drown. If you're dumb enough to be driving that close to a pond or out on the beach, then go ahead and do that. I happen to know from personal experiences, seatbelts save lives and injury. I've been the recipient on that on more than one occasion. That if I hadn't had it on, I'm positive I wouldn't be here. I know it was God's hand that held me back. I, I understand all that kind of stuff, but I've personally witnessed it. I personally, personally witnessed people that didn't have it and flew through windshields and got ejected from cars and had cars roll over on top of them. And I mean, I've seen them get knocked slam out of their tennis shoes, tennis shoes still tied, laying one of them right out here on San Jose Boulevard, tennis shoes still tied and 100 feet down the road, the body. How'd that happen? He hit him so hard, knocked him right out of his shoes. So how do you know? All kind of things happen like that. It's like tornadoes and stuff come through and grab stuff out of a house and leave other things alone. You can't explain some of that stuff. Here's all I'm trying to get across to you. I don't care if you wear it or not. It's a law. Don't make that spiritual. The only reason you do it is because you want to avoid a ticket and because you think, you know, you'll be the one that won't hit. Okay, go ahead. Just remember that most of you, when you have an accident, it's usually within five miles of your house. You say, why? You're creatures of habit. And the reason you have an accident is you start taking things for granted. And you ignore the signs and you start ignoring the lights and you start getting accustomed to things and you get real comfortable and then you get complacent. And the next thing you know, bam, somebody hits you and, you know, you've had a wreck. And then you're thinking, I sure wish I had on my seatbelt. I wouldn't have, you know, duck lips. I wouldn't have an imprint of a steering wheel on my head. 
I wouldn't have that powder all over me and that abrasion from the thing going off, airbag going off. But when it comes to real spiritual things, how will it stack up when the real judge judges you? How about when he judges you for your attitude toward others? Got kind of still there. Say your attitude, yeah. Come quickly over to Ephesians. See, it's a trick of the devil. See, preacher, I thought you were going to tell us what. Yeah, I know I'm talking about the persecution you're going to suffer and evil men wax worse and worse, and I'll get on to that tonight. But right now, this is important. You say, why? Well, you might die today. Amen. Today might be your last day. You may not get, you may not get warning. You may not get a, you, you have so much time, like Miss Elaine, you have so much time to be around, so get yourself ready. Quote, get your house in order. You better get it in order today. Like now. You know why you should be in church right now? First thing you should do is you should be like an accountant. You should be looking and checking your own records to find out if you were there. It don't matter what anybody thinks. I don't care what you think. It don't matter what anybody else thinks about whether you should or shouldn't be in church. It matters whether he thinks it or not. I'm not having the argument with you. I just don't believe you got to go to church to be saved. You don't. You absolutely don't have to go to church to be saved. But the Lord said, I made a church available for you after you're saved. Well, Lord, you know, it's just such a long way and I just have such a difficult... And there's so many hypocrites in the church and yeah, you know what? You know what I know about if a hypocrite stands between you and God, that means you're smaller than the hypocrite. You know what? If a hypocrite stands between you and God, you know, it's an, it's an amazing thing. That means the hypocrite's closer to God than you are. Hypocrites in the church. I don't like him, you know. I don't like his attitude. I don't like how he talks. I just, I just don't think if you're a preacher, you'd talk like that and all that kind of stuff. Okay, then find you another place. Amen. You're going to say that I'm the only place? Well, then find another place. Amen. Find you a Joel Osteen if that's what you want to do. But, but you're going to use, you're going to hang your hat on somebody at this church upsets you so that justifies you being out of all churches? How can you do that? How does that even make sense? That last passage, that I, this passage I'm fixing to show you here in just a second, it has nothing to do with how you look on the outside. I'm wore out with that. How you look on the outside, how you look on the outside. The Lord's not paying attention to how you look on the outside. He's paying attention to what's going on the inside, Christian. Amen. Like how you get along with others. Yeah. You say, why? That's what God judges you on. God doesn't judge you what you see in the mirror unless it's the mirror of His Word. You know what God judges you on? He judges you by how you treat your brothers and sisters. Can you get along with them except at Christmas time? <laughs> and Thanksgiving? Oh, joyous time of year. I tell you, honest to the Lord, I'm have Brother Holland do the fellowship hall first. You say, why? Hopefully by this time next year, that thing will be ready. We're going to have a big old turkey or chicken dinner in there for all of us misfits that would rather be with you than be with our own family. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 Just pass the turkey and sit around and eat and burp and throw biscuits at each other and... <laughs> And have the time of our life. You, you say why? And not put on a stinking put on deal. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. You ever wonder why when you get up there to heaven it ain't going to be like the Mormon said and you're going to all be seated by families? I got people closer to me than my own family. Amen. 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 You hear me? Yes, That's who I want to be sitting with. Yes. Wow, well, I don't have anything in common. I guess probably know too much about me growing up or whatever, I guess. I don't know. I love them. I appreciate them and that kind of a deal, but I spend more time with you. Amen. Ephesians chapter number 4, are you there? Yes, sir. Look in verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of what? Do you ever wonder about that? you ever ponder? you ever think about it? Why does he say that? Say so just to talk, just to stop your cussing and foul talk. 
No, no. He's giving you an indicator. He's saying if that corrupt communication is coming out of your mouth, you've got a heart problem. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You ever listen to what you talk about? You ever listen to who you talk about? You ever listen to what you worry about? You know what it is? It's the Lord saying to you, if you listen to yourself, do a tape recording sometime. It'll make you sick. Put that little thing on your uh, phone thing and record yourself and then forget your recording. You know what you can tell? You can tell a lot about where your heart is by listening to what you say. That's a, that's a bad test to take. And then watch what he says. I don't want you to smoke and to drink and to cuss or to chew and to make sure you do. No, that's not what he says. He says that you're supposed to be, use that which is good to the edifying, the encouragement of other people, not always dragging them down, that it may minister what? Grace. Grace. I've been the recipient of that. Now watch. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. Here's you some things to answer for at the judgment seat. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, that's where you get the word claymore from, and evil speaking be put away from you with all. Malice is an intentional damaging or hurt of somebody. Not a single thing in there is outward appearance. He said, I have the ability to grieve. Do you ever realize your power? You can grieve God. That's God, Holy Spirit. He's all God. You know what he said? You can stuck a rag in his mouth and duct tape, duct, duct tape his mouth shut. By what? By smoking. No, it ain't in there. Drinking, doing drugs, no. Carousing around, no, it ain't in there. Those things have to do with something entirely different. He's talking to a full-grown Christian here. And he says, I know what bother Christians. I know it's just Sunday school with that altar ought to be slam full of you thinking to yourself, well, good night, man. I never realized God gave me the power to overcome the Holy Spirit in my life and His working in my life because I, how I feel every one of those things is you toward somebody else. Every one of them. That's not you toward yourself. That's an outward manifestation toward somebody else of an inward problem on your part. How you think. How you think. How you think. How you think. If the devil can get you thinking wrong, he can get you acting wrong. All he has to do is get you thinking wrong. And the next Amen. thing you know, Amen. you're in a ditch. Yeah. Yes, Father, pray you bless your word and be with us in the upcoming service. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.